So we're all contributing to this um, Jamboard where we're you know, answering the question, what are the impacts or the effects of sexual violence on survivors? We've got a lot of great um, answers here being put in by all the participants. Becomes harder. A lot of stuff about trust, right? Shame. Lara, Lara put something in chat. Let's see. Isolation. Yes. Decreased capacity for all the other things in life. Mm -hmm. Decreased self esteem, sense of worthiness interpersonal connections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really unsafe. Doesn't feel comfortable when anyone touches them, even in a caring way. Sarah said in the chat, trust issues. Mm -hmm. uh, try to make yourself smaller. Yeah. That reminds me too of the book um, that Roxane Gay wrote called Hunger. I don't know if anybody's read that, but I highly recommend. And she talks about the aftermath of her sexual assault and actually trying to make herself bigger so that she could be safer inside her body um, and just eating uh, as a way of coping with the sexual assault that happened to her. Um, so again, when people, yeah, making themselves smaller. So people not, right? It's so unique as, um, as which is the one that says everyone's different. <laughs> yeah, this one, so important. Jess asks if you could put the name of the book in, in the chat. And Carly states, Future Healthy Intimate Relationships. Mm -hmm. That book is great. And Michelle has put that in the chat for everyone, the name of the book. Thank you for all that feedback. Good work. Make sure you're breathing. Don't hold your breath. It's a lot. It's intense. So let's look um, at this list and see if we missed anything. Impacts and effects. Shame, guilt, denial, minimizing, impacts boundaries, difficulty trusting, unrealistic sense of safety, constant sense of danger slash hypervigilance, self-harm, thoughts of suicide or dying, memory, i.e. can't remember or can't stop remembering, dissociation, body pain slash numbness, Disordered eating, isolation, substance abuse, substance use, excuse me, physical changes, mood disorders, changes in sexuality, i.e. lots of sex, no sex, super safe, not so safe. You all did a really good job enlisting. Um, on the jam board. Yeah, we all are coming to this, um, this course with a lot of information we already have. And we're just putting it all together. And then we're kind of meeting you where you're at, right? With the knowledge that you have, which is what we'll do 
with survivors when we're working with them, right? There's a lot of the things that they already know about how things are right, impacting them, right? And we're using our knowledge together to collaborate with them. Think about how the sexual assault is impacting them um, and filling in the blanks, right? Okay. <clears throat> so the dynamics of sexual assault is what we're going to talk about uh, primarily today. And that's going to be about trauma. It's going to be about um, just the ways in which sexual assault impacts survivors um, in really big ways. So some of the dynamics, the ways that it impacts uh, survivors uh, really depends on a few different things. What is the nature of the assault? How it happened, right? Um, what kind of assault it was? The number of assaults or instance incidences? Um, incidents or instances, I guess. I'm <laughs> just making one word out of that. The number of assaults. So if you were assaulted one time as an adult compared to being assaulted over a series of times throughout your childhood by the same person, right? It really changes um, how you're impacted. The level of emotional, physical, spiritual, and sexual violence, right? If you were abused by a stranger or assaulted by a stranger, it's going to be really different than if you were assaulted by uh, a parishioner at your church, uh, the pastor, right? Or um, a priest, right? The spiritual impact is going to be really different. The emotional impact is going to be really different. If you were assaulted really violently, as opposed to, um, you know, a series of, of assaults where it was um, more um, creepy touching and things like that, or, um, you know, so all, all of those different things, the level of that emotional, physical, spiritual, and sexual violence, and the ways in which it happened, uh, really impact how we respond to it. The relationship between the perpetrator and the survivor, and this is one of the big things that makes it so different from domestic violence. A lot of the times um, our programs are doing both DV and uh, sexual assault, right? Uh, and the, way, the biggest difference between, between the two is really because domestic violence is defined by the relationship between the perpetrator and the survivor. It's always the same, right? It's an intimate partner. But when we're looking at sexual assault, those relationships are so varied, right? It could be somebody that you met at a frat party. It could be the guard um, at the prison where you were incarcerated. It can be uh, a stepfather, an uncle. Uh, it can be a date. You know, so those different relationships really vary the impact in a way that when you're working with DV, you're like someone who, who you love or at least once loved harmed you. And with sexual assault, that can look really different. Sometimes it's that for sure. But other times it's like, I don't even know this person or this person abused their authority, right? Uh, some of the dynamics also depend on when the survivor remembers an assault. We're going to talk a little bit about memory this morning uh, and think about how that's going to impact folks, right? Because if you are 40 and you're remembering what happened to you at four, um, the ways that you're going to cope uh, and feel and the kind of help and support you're going to need is going to look really different than if you were assaulted yesterday and rem remember everything about it. And then one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest kind of um, things about how a survivor is impacted and how they heal and if they find justice and help is the presence of a really good support system. So if, if the dynamic is that we are kind of an isolated person now, we're living far from, for example, our home country and all of our family is back in our home country and we're assaulted. We don't have that presence of that good support system that we might if they all lived there. Or if, you know, we are uh, coming from a 
history of, of being in foster care, not having a stable home, our presence of a good support system is going to be impacted by that. And if we're sexually assaulted later on, even if it's not connected to um, the foster care system or not connected to in any way our immigration status, um, the, the lack of or the actual presence of that good support system is such a difference maker. Right? So what is trauma? Somebody on maybe the first day, second day, talked about Bessel van der Kolk's The Body Keeps the Score. And that's a really important uh, book for the kind of work that we do. I highly recommend it. Um, it's really accessible as well for um, something that's, that's written about trauma, right? And one of the things that he says is that being traumatized is not just an issue of being stuck in the past, it is just as much a problem of not being fully alive in the present. And when we did the rape culture, when you did the rape culture um, and uh, intersections between rape culture and anti-Black racism webinars, we looked a lot at not being fully present, not, not being able to be fully actualized, not being able to fully experience you know, joy and freedom because of the fear that rape culture causes the fear of this inevitability of being sexually assaulted. So some of us, because of the communities that we belong to, even have this kind of low grade all the time, not being fully alive in the present. And then when we have a traumatization that happens, um, which occurs when both internal and external resources are inadequate to cope with a external threat. Um, the way we think, the way we learn, the way we remember things, the way we hold and move our bodies, the way we feel about ourselves, the way we feel about other people, and the way we make sense of the world are all profoundly altered by the traumatic experience. Trauma really fragments our, our brains, right? Um, Tracy, do you want to talk about rape trauma? Yes. Thanks, Michelle. So rape trauma. Survivors can appear, experience somatic, cognitive, psychological, and behavioral stress responses after an assault. These reactions may happen immediately afterwards, or the survivor may have a delayed reaction. They might last for a short period of time or a long period of time. They can be, as I mentioned, somatic, meaning in the body, like feeling sick, stomach aches, nausea, or back pain. Cognitive, affecting the brain, how we think or process, get distracted, psychological, depression, anxiety, PTSD. Um, these, sim these symptoms may last for a short period of time or a long period of time. Um, and they may, the reactions can happen immediately afterwards or a delayed reaction. The body is amazing and the um, brain and the subconscious really want to protect us, the human. And so it's really um, unpredictable how and when we're gonna feel any of these after, after an assault, after a rape. Thanks, Patricia. Um, Michelle, do you wanna talk about Uh, I just want to say a little bit also about just adult survivors of child sexual assault because there are just some real different dynamics that are important for us to be thinking about. Um, adults who have survived childhood sexual assault may reach out to advocates for a number of reasons, whereas somebody who was assaulted recently might reach out for really different reasons. And we talk a lot about those, but don't talk as much about these adult survivors of child sexual assault who utilize a crisis line and an advocate pretty frequently. So they are confronted with a repressed memory of childhood sexual assault. 
they might be currently experiencing violence or abuse and that reminds them that there's this other stuff that they're still dealing with and working with. They may not have had resources or support that now they can access. Right? And just now they're able to reach out and say, this thing happened to me. So it's really important for us as the, in the work that we do that we're thinking about how we're defining crisis and how we think about safety. <coughs> Excuse me. So we wanna make sure that our services are set up for crisis and safety in the different ways that uh, adult survivors of child sexual abuse are gonna define it, right? Because when somebody reaches out with a, with a repressed memory of childhood, as we're gonna to continue to talk about how that kind of impacts your, your brain, your body, um, your moods, um, that uh, they are experiencing that kind of as if they are in it now. And that crisis is, feels like it's now. One of the things, again, that is so different than domestic violence is that um, I always think of it in terms of safety. Um, when I was working with the, on a, both the domestic violence and sexual assault hotlines, the ways that I would talk about safety is so different uh, with DD survivors who are looking to get in a physically more safe space away from somebody who is actively harming them. And with sexual assault, it was always so hard to think about safety because it's more more of an emotional safety. I can't make you safe from your body that feels now unsafe. Um, that the scene of that is, is always kind of with you. And although domestic violence really impacts the body as well, it is so, there's so much emotional, there's so many emotional pieces around that. Um, that the dynamics are just super different. So I just wanted to kind of, again, highlight some of those differences because a lot of us are coming from a place where we're working with both deviant sexual assault. And so thinking about that is really important um, in the ways we think about safety and the ways we think about crisis, okay? <clears throat> Uh, I really like this quote from um, Bass and Davis who wrote The Courage to Heal. They also did The Courage to Heal Workbook, which is a book, uh, kind of like a self-help book for um, adult survivors of child sexual abuse. Um, and it's been used um, pretty, pretty frequently since the 90s. There's still some really good stuff in there. Um, and one of the things they talk about is the ways in which we heal. Um, they use this image of a spiral and they, they say, you go through the sta same stages again and again, but traveling up the spiral, you pass through them at a different level with a different perspective. With each new cycle, your capacity to feel, to remember, and to make lasting changes is strengthened. When we as advocates are really grounded in this understanding, it helps to set the foundation for us in providing services that anticipate and respond to the trauma that survivors have experienced, right? As someone's, you know, uh, as someone said within the, the jam board, um, everyone is different, right? The way you can't say one way or another how somebody's gonna interact. But we do know that nothing's linear, that you're not harmed here and you heal here, and here are all the ways that you get there, right? But that's just not reality. That we, um, but that we do get better. Mike Liu, who's a therapist that works a lot with male survivors, um, one of the things that he, he said he would get asked a lot uh, by his um, clients was, uh, when is this gonna be better? When is this going to be over? And he, he, he said one of the things that he says often is not as long as you fear, but longer than you'd like, right? Like we want to be done. And I think that there's a lot of frustration with that for those of us that are sexual assault survivors. Like we want to be done. We want to get healed right now. Uh, especially for those of us that are really, um, you know, raised in cultures that really value 
you know, just, um, you know, moving on, um, you know, not dwelling, value perfectionism, um, different oppressions that we internalize, like, I got to, I got to take care of this so I can move on and do these other things that are more important, right? Um, And so I think that, that the spiral, that the way Mike Lee talks about it is really um, beneficial in the ways we talk to survivors about what they can expect, right? Because promising, right? We don't do that. We learned that on the first day. We never promise, you know, when something's going to happen. And so finding these different ways to both um, validate, normalize, reassure, do positive framing, which we're going to talk about in the next session, um, are all super important to uh, the ways that we set expectations with survivors about how they heal. Patricia, did you want to add something? I don't have anything to add, Michelle. Thank you. You, you popped in and so it looked like you wanted it. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I just did. I was just preparing, but I like what Omni says in the chat. I could share that. Oh, what's so yeah. statements made worthy of being prints on a wall? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So this is all just really just helpful framing for when you're working with survivors because some people are ready to be healed tomorrow and it's just not likely to happen. Um, and just an example of what this is kind of like, I feel as a survivor, I feel like um, there's different aspects of my trauma and my healing that I continue to kind of come back to. Um, and I'm like, I thought I did this already, but I have to deal with it in a different way, right? And that's the kind of spiral. Like everything just keeps coming around. It's like every three days, this is really bugging me. And then every three weeks, maybe it's bugging me because I've found some new ways of coping with that. Uh, I went to cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, And so now I found some really good ways of working with, you know, being grounded and reassuring my safety to myself and practicing self-compassion and doing those kind of things. And then as I move further up, um, you know, it's like three years and I'm like, oh no, this is back again. And I'm like, okay, let's try some, but I'm feeling it in my body this time. So let me try some trauma-informed yoga to kind of work this out because I've got I got my other tools. Let me, let me put some more tools in here. And that it's just a constant thing. Uh, well, it's not constant, but it's a, it's a reoccurring thing that becomes less constant as we move forward. But when, we, when it shows up, we're like, oh, there's that thing again. Um, but it doesn't throw us back as much as it does when we're really tight in the spiral, right? That is when we're really just starting to heal from it. Um, that we in, in ways create relationships with this trauma and with our healing to say, okay, I see you're here again. I know what you are this time though. So you're not catching me off guard and I know about my tools um, and I can utilize them. Um, this is Patricia. What are triggers? Triggers are automatic responses connected to your past sexual abuse slash assault that suddenly rush to the present. Um, Certain acts, smells, words, perhaps even a tone of voice can act as triggers that bring up images and feelings from the past. When you are in the middle of being triggered, it may be difficult to distinguish from the past and the present. And this is from Stacey Haynes, author of The Survivor's Guide to Sex. And one um, experience I can share of a loved one of mine, she was at a bus stop waiting to board the bus to go to work in the early morning and looked over to her side and saw a man uh, there. um, And that man's hands were very similar to the hands of the rapist and boom, there you go. And you're just starting your day, you're walking along, doing what you need to do and you're thrown against the wall or to the floor. Um, 
So that's one example. I'm going to read from my notes now. Survivors often can help figuring, excuse me, survivors often can use help figuring out what is going on in their brains and bodies. Often asking advocates, is this normal? Triggers are a common part of recovery from trauma and advocates will need to be familiar with triggers and can work with survivors to plan for how they will respond when triggers come up and what strategies they might want to try. A helpful place to start is to work with the survivor on figuring out what kinds of situations, sense, interactions, tones of voice, etc., might cause them to be triggered. When survivors are more aware of what triggers them, it makes it easier to plan. This knowledge can help a survivor avoid triggers or create strategies to cope when triggers are a surprise or are unavoidable. Working with survivors to identify coping techniques is a really important part of our role. And in that role, I wanna add throughout this whole work that we do, self-care is really important because we have our own stuff. And, and um, so it's really, really important to be aware. As Michelle said, we're ever evolving. As long as we're breathing, we are evolving. And so what we're doing in this point as an advocate is assisting the survivor in gaining resources within themselves and awareness and like, you know, digging in and, and what is my awareness? Well, my awareness is different than it was the last time, as Michelle said, when, we, when I first did this Advocate Corps training back in September of 2019, I was, I'd never done Advocate Corps training. As I mentioned, my, me and my kids are survivors and, um, I was really gung-ho and ready to go. And then we get to Spokane and all of a sudden I am in pain, excruciating pain. And I'm like, oh, I can't get sick. And for me, it'll manifest in my left hip and it affects my walking. And so I'm like, okay, I'm having a somatic response to having to, not having to, to doing my job which is training um, new advocates to support sexual assault survivors. And um, I, just, I just needed to be aware of that. And um, I didn't do much in that training. It was my first time I did some. And I just, during the breaks, I just walked, walked it out, self-talk, it's okay, yeah, it, you know, it is this and, and um, but, it's, um, it's so real, it's so real. And it lasted the whole time. It would get a little bit better, but um, our body keeps the score, that book, right? Absolutely, I totally remember that when we were training together, because you're like, I gotta go for another walk. <laughs> All right, dissociation. Um, so let's see. When people are dissociating, they disconnect from their surroundings, which can stop trauma memories and lower fear and anxiety and shame. It's a fairly normal coping strategy in the face of this overwhelming stress. Um, so sometimes triggers can lead to dissociation. Dissociation is also a skill. Um, that's survivors who are experiencing a lot of continued abuse um, utilize. It's because it's super effective. Um, it is about being disconnected from the here and now. All of us really occasionally have daydreams or mind wandering, which is normal. Um, sometimes dissociation is a way of coping by avoiding negative thoughts or feelings related to memories of traumatic events. There was a one survivor that I worked with and he um, kept uh, driving to the wrong place. He was dissociating so much throughout his day 
then he kept driving to the wrong places because he was on autopilot, right? And then he would end up at work when he's trying to go, you know, to home or trying to go to the store and would end up over here. And then he would get there and be like, what did I, when did this happen? How did this happen? His dissociation, because his child abuse, uh, his child sexual abuse is so extreme that he just could never really just be staying present. It was a huge, um, so it was manifesting a lot by just, he's late all the time because he was trying to go to his appointment to see the doctor, to see his therapist or to meet with me or whatever, and then would end up at work or a different place because he was just autopiloting throughout his life. Uh, and so those are kind of just really common things that I think that we, we come across and, and why so many people that we work with are late um, because it's just, it's, it's just, just a super common thing. Um, the difference from active avoidance, whereas like the on-purpose avoiding thinking of doing something is that dissociation tends to happen without the planning or even awareness. Many times people who are dissociating are not even aware that it is happening. Other people might notice it. You know, kind of, are you here? Are you? Hi, where did you go? Right? Um, it's a safety valve and it's very effective. Um, there, uh, one of my colleagues did a lot of doula work. She was a sexual assault advocate, but also did a lot of doula work, which is like a birth attendant, right? Um, and she was working with a survivor who had gone through a ton of healing and, um, you know, felt really great. And when she became pregnant, lots of stuff around her sexual assault started coming up again, uh, right? And this is common because you lose control of your body and what your body's doing. And that can be really triggering on an ongoing basis for sexual assault survivors. And so she made a plan with her advocate and doula and said, you know what? I think when I give birth, I think I'm gonna dis disassociate. And I just, I think I'm just gonna, that that's just gonna be my plan. That I'm just gonna dissociate because I think that's the way I'm gonna have to move through it, right? She was just really, um, aware of how she was going to react. And she said, you know, my plan is just to not try to interrupt it. Like, let's just, let's just get through it. Um, like I'm really aware that I might want to remember this, but I think that I, I think that this is the best way, um, for me to do this and that they talked about it. And that was just her plan. So sometimes we, even when we get new coping skills, we fall back on old ones in like real stressful times and that's you know that's normal it makes sense um and we work with survivors on whatever it is that they say this is what i need this is what i want um dissociation can kind of look like spacing out or daydreaming like you said a glazed look or staring mind going blank or mind wandering um, a sense of the world not being real. I hear that one a lot. Um, watching or seeing yourself kind of from the outside, kind of a change in perspective. Um, and then other really extreme ways can be like an out-of-body experience, a detachment from yourself or your identity. Um, and then of course, just disconnected from surroundings. And the antidote to dissociation is grounding. Right? because of that disconnected from surroundings. Where am I? Okay, I'm here now. And there's so many different ways that we can work to cope uh, with dissociation, with triggers. Um, but this is also part of the planning that we do with survivors. Um, there's the 54321 activity. Is anybody familiar with that? If you are, would you like to unmute and share it? If not, I can share it, but it's always great if somebody else can share it.
I, I actually like to make okay I'm just like I like to make sure I give enough time go ahead yeah um because we just covered this in my class so it's like a grounding exercise where um what we did is we imagined like our happiest place like and I imagined like a beach and then five things you can see there um four things you can touch three things you can hear two things you can smell and like one thing you can taste absolutely thank you so much yeah that that's a really useful um, activity that you can do when you're anywhere. Like you can be in a meeting and be like, okay, I'm dissociating. Um, let me, and, and you can do it where you're, you know, you take yourself to the beach, um, like she said, or you can also do it based on where you're at right now. Like I'm in this room and okay, this desk feels like this and I can smell, smell the candle that's burning. I can feel, right? You're just trying to like get in touch with those surroundings. And the five, four, three, two, one can kind of help you remember, you know, all these different senses in our bodies that we're trying to, to uh, access. Thanks for sharing that. Gracie mm -hmm. says um, meditation is good as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can be a little bit harder for people because you're, you know, practicing sitting alone with yourself, you know, with your mind going. Sometimes that takes a little bit more practice um, that starting out with a few different things or um, yoga is also really good for, for that kind of thing. Cause you're kind of doing something. And then that kind of, I always found that exercise was such a super useful thing at different times in my own healing and coping, because it was like, I know that for this hour during the day that my mind's not going to be that, that. I was doing like jazz or size or something where I was like, this is, it, it was incredibly effective because you have to follow the routine that you don't have any time to be thinking about the things that are stressing you out, that you don't have time to be thinking about trauma because you're trying to follow along with the routines. Um, that different things like that, like in a yoga class and a dance class, all of those things can really like take your mind out of, um, the trauma and the stress and our really good coping mechanisms running also and things like that. Um, because sometimes meditating while sitting still can be really hard for some people when they feel it in their bodies, that moving their bodies can be something that's really impactful. <clears throat> Tracy, let's do some belly breathing. Kila, Kila's butt. Yeah, Kila. Um, so we're gonna do some breathing. Um, and it's really similar to the way newborns and babies breathe. And you can see if you've been around a newborn, the little tummy, when the inhale goes up. Um, so just be aware of your, where you're sitting and what you're sitting on, your feet on the floor and I don't like some people say breathe in to account of this and hold it for account of this. And we're also individuals. So just take a deep breath. Hold it for a little bit. And then when you exhale, really make exhale, getting all that breath out. And that way we're using our whole lungs. Do that for a few minutes, a few times. And also stretching if you feel comfortable, doing some neck rolls or even some side, you know, just ear to shoulder. That feels good. Chin to chest. And on my notes, Michelle, it says we're going to take a short seven minute break. So we'll come back. 41, 1041. See everyone at 10.
Okay, we're going to talk about neurobiology of trauma, right? Because there are a number of reasons why sexual assault is not the fault of the survivor, right? We learned about that uh, when we were talking about rape culture, right? Um, but also science is one of them. Uh, a lot of times survivors will ask themselves, why didn't I fight, for example, or why can't I remember what happened? And this information can be useful to think kind of more kindly about your body and brain's reaction to the violence that you experienced um, because science, right? I found this also super useful in my work with male survivors um, that it was an easier approach for some folks who have been socialized uh, around masculinity, uh, around not being in touch with emotions as well. Um, that talking about kind of the way that your body and your brain reacts can be an easier entry point for some people. Um, one of the more recent um, times that neurobiology of trauma was really showcased was in the uh, Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh's hearings. Um, and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, when she was giving her testimony in those hearings, one of the things that she said um, that really stood out for me as a sexual assault kind of professional person um, that was just not the kind of thing that you heard uh, really often, but she said, indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter, the uproarious laughter between the two. They're having fun at my expense. And the hippocampus is the structure in the brain that processes information into memories. It takes in all kinds of different sensory information that's going on in the world right now, and it organizes it. And this is a process called encoding, right? And our way of remembering things is dramatically changed under stress. When we're overwhelmed with fear, we lose the capacity for speech at times. We often, the capacity to put words into um, to our experience, right? And so as we looked at the beginning, we looked at some images of weather. So how do we feel? What's our energy, right? Um, because again, sometimes it's hard to know how I feel right now, right? So sometimes looking at things using a visual cue can be really helpful. With Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, what was uh, significant to her was a sound, right? And as one of our participants here, I can't remember your name, I'm so sorry, because um, I couldn't see your, your face and your camera, um, but said about the five, four, three, two, one, right? That we're getting in touch with all of our senses, right? And for her, it was the sound. What she remembers most is them laughing. And that's what sticks with her, right? So without words, our mind shifts into that visceral form of memory visual, uh, auditory, olfactory, right? Smell, uh, kinesthetic, how we feel, the positions our body was in, um, physical sensations, um, and um, um, feelings, not emotional feelings, but feelings like on our skin or heat, cold, different things like that. And then flashbacks happen with an intrusive re-experiencing of those unverbalized memories. So it's not really remembering, but rather reliving sometimes when, when that happens. So in addition to providing opportunities for uh, survivors to talk about their experiences, we have to also provide opportunities that focus on nonverbal expression that can help with that trauma release, right? So I talked about exercise, right? Moving your body, talked about um, the five, four, three, two, one. We, we, we checked in using some different weather um, visuals, right? Different things like that and how we're incorporating into the work that we do with survivors and how we work with them to incorporate that into their own lives, their own coping uh, and the different things that work for them.
So our way of remembering, as I just said, is, is uh, dramatically changed under, under stress. I jumped ahead in my presentation. So this is the, the slide that I was talking about before. My apologies. Um, when um, the Kavanaugh hearings were happening, we were watching them a lot at work. Um, and so many of us that were survivors were really impacted by that. And I remember um, afterwards talking with survivors for an article that we did on survivor activism. Um, one of my colleagues had gone to Washington, D.C. to participate in the protests that were happening there. Um, the survivors that were, you know, just, um, I'll never forget the, the hallway, what, what I was calling the hallway heroes, the women who were, who had come from Arizona and were yelling at Senator Flake in the, in the um, elevator about their experiences of sexual assault. Um, and just thinking about um, how so much of our work was kind of on display as well as all the different ways that survivors um, feel and act and, and advocate for themselves. Um, and it was so powerful, such a powerful time. I remember being really uh, impacted during that time and forgetting all of my coping mechanisms <laughs> because it was just so overwhelming, such an overwhelming time for survivors. The sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Um, so the sympathetic is the one that's ready to respond, the one that does the action without thought. It's hypervigilance, it's fight, flight, freeze. Um, the sympathetic nervous system is super helpful when you are in danger, like when you are running from a bear. Many survivors get really stuck in the sympathetic nervous system especially if abuse has been more long-term um, or extraordinarily violent. Um, but also everybody is different, right? So so many trauma survivors can get stuck here uh, regardless of the dynamics of the sexual assault. And then the parasympathetic, that's when we're calm. That's when we're relaxed and asleep. This is when our body heals and engages in metabolic processes like digestion. Um, this is why things like yoga and body work can be super effective uh, way to heal because it helps us, helps our nervous system drop in from sympathetic to parasympathetic. And Patricia had mentioned, you know, about, um, you know, feeling sick, right? Um, in some of those um, ways that trauma, rape trauma manifests. And there are so many survivors who experience digestive issues, um, Crohn's disease, um, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, for trauma survivors is that they're not dropped into their sympathetic, I mean, their parasympathetic nervous system to be able to do, be doing those processes like digestion. And then sometimes that can lead to inflammation and all kinds of other things, right? So, you know, survivors who are experiencing trauma that also like all of a sudden have to go to the bathroom or can't go to the bathroom, for example, those are all super normal things that we can, as advocates, normalize and validate if this is the kind of information that we have. Um, and also sometimes things that I like to bring up about the differences between that sympathetic and parasympathetic, um, because it might help to them to normalize for themselves things that they're not ready to talk about, like their bowel movements, right? <laughs> like how their stomach is feeling. But I just think it's just been such a common thing in my experience working with survivors that the digestive issues is huge. So let's talk about fight and flight um, because most people, this is the kind of basic um, um, folks talk about, um, I'm doing the folks thing again, Patricia. Um, a lot of people talk about fight, 
and flight as like, those are the two things that you do when you are experiencing trauma. And it's not true, but they are the first two that we kind of think about. And those are the biological mechanisms to protect us from harm. They happen when we perceive that we're in danger. And each episode of danger connects to every other episode in our mind. So the more danger we're exposed to, the more sensitive we are to danger and might pop into that fight or flight feeling, even though we might not be technically in danger, but we're in a situation that reminds us, right? So Patricia was talking about her family member who saw the hands of the gentleman that was getting on the bus as well. And that episode connected with another episode in her mind of danger. And so we become more sensitive to that. Freeze is going to be the one of the most common things that we come in contact with when we're working with survivors. Freeze or um, tonic immobility is the most common nearly universal trauma response for individuals who's, who have experienced sexual assault, right? So this is, this is the tool that we have. This is the tool we have to normalize and validate with the survivor that says, why didn't I just fight? We have great scientific explanations for that. That can be so helpful when working with survivors, right? This is sometimes referred to as rape-induced paralysis. It is autonomic, meaning that it is uncontrollable. A victim in, the state, in a state of tonic immobility cannot move. You see there are some animals that experience tonic immobility. Um, there are the fainting goats. They have very sensitive um, freeze responses um, and they just freeze and kind of fall over. They're called fainting goats. Um, we see this with um, possums and other animals that play dead, right? The freeze response is where trauma is locked in your tissues. And this holds true from everything to car, from car accidents to uh, physical and sexual uh, violence um, to emotional trauma and stress. It locks up our spine, our abdomen, our breath. Everything becomes kind of smaller and tighter. Uh, it decreases our respiration, right? Because we're trying to save our breath, save our energy. So slow, shallow breathings short, um, excuse me, not slow, short and shallow breathing. It decreases the range of motion of the rib cage. And this response that kept you from harm also becomes a response that keeps you from healing, right? It keeps you from dropping into those parasympathetic nervous systems, right? This freeze response where we're all locked up in our torso is us kind of existing in the sympathetic nervous system. Um, this is why so much more as, as we learn about the neurobiology of trauma, why we are really expanding the ways we think about what services uh, are useful for healing for survivors, like body work, right? Like touch and massage, like releasing the, the body that is keeping the score, right? As Bessel van der Kolk talks about, right? Releasing that, helping people drop into their parasympathetic nervous system so they can sleep, so they can digest, so they can rest, um, so that they can experience freedom and joy and, you know, um, not feel like they're in danger all the time. Um, so oh, Cass asks, uh, how might you respond to a survivor who says, I wish I had done something differently? Yeah, we're going to do some practicing around that um, pretty soon. But I think um, that what I would say is, even if it's like, regardless of what it is that happened to that survivor or what they, how they kind of, um, how they responded, whether it was fight, flight, or freeze. Um, I think I would just say, you know, the ways we react to trauma are autonomic, right? Fight, flight, freeze. These are things that are all just the things that take over when we don't, when we can't respond. Um, and I think so talking about how trauma interacts with our body is how I would respond to that that you don't really, you're not in a place of choosing, 
Because one, somebody took away a choice from you. And two, your body takes away your choice as well. So it's like double, double down on the no choices, right? Does that make sense? And then I'll also add here um, a piece. So fight, flight, freeze, and appease. Some people call it fawning. And this is when we appeal to, um, uh, we are compliant. Um, we kind of just appeal to um, the person who is harming us. Um, we see this in really clearly in the series Unbelievable, which is a series on Netflix about uh, two different women's experience of sexual assault from the same serial uh, predator. And it, it's a very accurate, it's one of the more accurate representations of sexual violence um, and all of the dynamics surrounding that in the criminal justice system that I've seen kind of portrayed. It's very not special victims unit because it's really long and things don't go well, right? More realistic. But one of the survivors um, talks about how, you know, she talked to him for a long time, the man that raped her. And she asked him a lot of questions, she's trying to keep him talking, right? We see a lot of domestic violence survivors do this kind of thing as well. Um, human trafficking survivors, you know, just trying to keep the person appeased so that they will not further abuse them. So it's another interaction that one is um, sometimes less autonomic and strategy, but can be really autonomic when that's kind of your socialization, if you've been socialized to appease. So for a lot of women, this might be another um, aspect because of internalized sexism and socialization around um, appeasing or caretaking or fixing, um, if that was a role within their family, that's something that we kind of can drop into uh, when we're trying to stay safe from danger. Okay, we're gonna do an activity. We're gonna go into some breakout rooms. Um, I'm gonna share the activity handout here in the chat in just a second. Okay, folks can pull this up. And some breakout rooms and you're gonna look at um, these different responses, these examples from survivors. I should have done this. I feel like it's my fault. And we're going to practice with each other thinking about how we would respond to that. And you can do actual role plays or you can just talk amongst yourself in some different examples. As Patricia said, we're trying to look for our authentic voice, right? How are we most authentically able to describe things and choose words that work well for us? to be able to explain a lot of these things. So we are going to go into breakout rooms. It's gonna take me just a second. I need to put interpreters in the right place. Um, and then we are going to um, do some practicing. Okay, folks are coming back from the breakout rooms. Just give a couple more minutes for folks to get all in here. I have, I have a printout of the PowerPoints and so Keila has decided to lay on them. Oh, great. Of course. She's the, really the best helper, that one. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, everyone's back. So um, does anyone want to share uh, back from their um, conversations, um, any ways that you really liked the way somebody kind of uh, talked about or explained it or use their own words to talk about that? Um, you can uh, chat or you can unmute yourself and share uh, if there's anything that you wanna kind of talk about how someone responded or how you responded. Um, we spoke about how a lot of the answers that we give would be kind of similar. Just what's your name? Olivia. Okay. Olivia. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that, you know, like it said on the worksheet that it's mostly just validating their feelings and that it's okay to feel that way and that it's a normal reaction. Mm -hmm. Yep. What else? The uh, prompt, I thought it was over this, uh, for me is indicative of somebody who has done the work um, and, and thought that they had processed everything um, and is finding themselves reliving it again. And I feel like uh, this is a, a statement where we have to acknowledge that they have done the work and I let them know that it is something that um, that they may have to continue to do the work over um, moving forward and that there's no real as you were saying earlier it the the healing is not linear right right so yeah we're normalizing and validating that the healing isn't linear right i thought it was over this yeah not so common you know i think a lot of people feel that way in my experience working with survivors, I see this all the time, right? It's different ways of saying like, you are not the only one who feels this way. You're not the only one who thinks that you're, you're over this. And then being able to, you know, use the spiral or use the quote from the courage to heal or those different things to be able to say. And here, here's some more information about that. Here's kind of some different ways to think about this. Anyone else? Is there anything that you were like, we couldn't really think about how to kind of reframe that or normalize and validate that for somebody and you would like me to do it or Patricia? Can you state that again, Michelle? Sorry. Oh, I was just wondering if, they, if anybody wanted either you or I to, uh, to show how we might respond if any of these felt like places that you got stuck kind of thinking about how to reframe. Mm -hmm. Which one, Cass? Uh, I feel like it's my fault. Okay, great. I would I would probably begin with I hear what you're saying. And that is a very, very common way to feel. You're here, you, I'm so glad you're here right now talking to me about this. Mm -hmm. The, um, you're not the predator. You're not the one who did this to somebody. You're the survivor. And I mentioned it in um, the session I was in, the breakout session, really slowing your cadence down when you're speaking so it really lands. Thank you, Grecia, you're not alone. Yeah. Um, and pausing and just like slowing down time as you're talking with them about it. 
because um, of all the reasons stated regarding the neurobiology of it all. Okay. Michelle, what would you like to add? Sure. Um, yeah, usually what I, I say is, yeah, I've, you know, uh, so many survivors that I work with say the same thing. Um, I always try to bring in other people to this, to the conversation, um, to help to fight that isolation. Sexual violence is incredibly isolating, right? And so we normalize and validate to kind of try to work, work that back. Um, like Grace has said, you're not alone. Yeah. And you're not alone in, in that feeling. So many survivors that I've worked with have said, I feel like it's my fault. And what I can tell you is that it's not. Right. Um, so many survivors feel like it's their fault because, you know, they couldn't fight enough or, you know, they put themselves in this situation. And what I know is that you don't deserve to be assaulted, no matter what you wear, no matter where you are. Right. So I, I would probably uh, kind of talk about that. Of course, it depends on who you're talking to and what you've talked to them about before, always. Yeah, what else? Great job. Thank you all for jumping in and practicing. You know, it's hard. And just remember, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Uh, it is hard and you don't know. Uh, and that's why we practice. Okay? So I appreciate you all jumping in and trying. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, trauma. One, two, we have five slides left and then we'll end for the day. Peter Levine is another great uh, teacher, thinker, writer on issues of trauma. He wrote a book called uh, Waking the Tiger uh, and a couple of other books as well. Um, I think he also has a web page uh, where you can see more about his work. Um, but one of the things that um, is really important uh, for me to remember is that trauma is not what happens to us but what we hold inside in the absence of an empathetic witness. Survivors need someone to witness. And so often that is what our role is. And it feels really hard to just be that witness because you're holding somebody else's story, but also because you can't fix it. You can't give them a thing. Uh, and, and we are socialized in patriarchal, white supremacist, capitalist society, right? And in capitalism, it's all about exchanging, you know, goods for money, um, giving a thing that's about materials and witnessing and listening is not those things. The work that we do is undervalued by the society that we live in. And so that can be really hard to value what it is that you do. And I'm going to continue to talk about this when we're talking about advocacy skills, when we're talking about crisis intervention, that you as a witness is what is important in pushing back against this trauma because of the isolation and because of what we are holding inside in the absence of an empathetic witness. There are not people around who are equipped to be able to hear these hard things. Uh, one of the things that um, has always been really clear to me it with um, particularly with one of my uncles is that he doesn't want to know about what I do because and I can tell because every time I say even just the, you know where I work which is the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs I can't talk about the work that I do without saying sexual assault it's inherent in what I do and every time I would say that my uncle would kind of his face kind of twitch like ugh, that words those words I don't like them um, and that's what survivors are dealing with all the time, right? That's that, that thing that people don't want to talk about that is too disturbing to think about, um, that people don't want to talk about sex and sexuality and body parts and all of those things. And so 
being that empathetic witness is incredibly important in the role that we do. And we have to really value it. Uh, we use volunteers, we use underpaid advocates, we are nonprofit organizations. All of that lends, lends itself to this undervalued work. But you, you have to know that it's incredibly important. So what I do is I keep this quote up in my office and then that helps me remember and value myself the importance of this work, the importance of listening, of being a witness um, because other people are not equipped to do that. And that's our job. I wanna talk just briefly about historical trauma. Um, Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart is another teacher thinker, um, uh, doctor of, I think, um, social work. She has a doctorate maybe in social work, I think. And she has done a lot of studying and writing about historical trauma. These are just a couple of quotes that she says. Um, the collective emotional and psychological injury, both over the lifespan and across generations, resulting from a cataclysmic history of genocide. This is how she describes historical trauma of Native American communities. She also says it's a cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations, emanating from massive group trauma. Right? So in addition to, for example, cycles of genocide and disenfranchisement of, um, that Native Americans have been subjected to, um, they've also been deterred from resolving their grief through things like federal prohibitions against different ceremonial practices and ways of life and speaking their language, right? And the taking over of different um, sacred spaces. So historical trauma is also linked to this um, historical traumatic grief not being able to um, be uh, released, right? Um, because that's also being controlled through this historical trauma. Uh, other work on historical trauma comes from um, Japanese Americans who were taken from their homes and dispossessed of all their, uh, their homes, their, their farms. Um, and branded as untrustworthy and potentially disloyal to their own country because of their race or ethnicity uh, connected to a country that the U.S. was at war with, right? Survivors and descendants have processed this experience of the camps um, in really complex ways over time. Responses ranging from low self-esteem to the avoidance of trauma impacted up to the third generation after those who were um, incarcerated in these camps. Even sometimes the fourth generation. There have been profound and long lasting effects of Japanese Americans whose families were incarcerated um, in overt family communication styles, unspoken messages related to ethnicity and um, all of these have, uh, they've lessened throughout generations, but have been impacting those. We also see this with um, the Holocaust, uh, survivors of the Holocaust and how that historical trauma has been also passed down. We see this in historical trauma of African-American communities of generations uh, that come from enslaved, um, Africans, right? All of these pieces, again, we have to be rooted in the social and political context in which survivors are living, that historical trauma is a real thing that is connected to their other trauma. And one of the things that we talked about earlier was that in fight and flight, right, that each episode of danger or what we consider to be trauma connects to every other episode in our minds. And so the more danger we're exposed to, the more sensitive we are to danger. Again, we talked about this in the rape culture um, presentation as well, and the experience of, um, of Black American communities 
in, in their relationships uh, and fear of police, right? That those are rooted in real historical traumas, whether or not it's actually happening to you on a daily basis, it is the knowledge that it could, it is a feeling of inevitability. And those things come from this historical trauma place as well. Attacks on our identities. Oh, Patricia, this is you. you talk. Thank you, Michelle. Trauma and oppression. Attacks on our identities and sense of self are, are a common part of sexual and physical violence. Many individuals experience constant microaggressions related to their identity, in addition to the trauma of physical and sexual violence. To be oppressed is to be traumatized. I saw a huge sign in Seattle that said, um, racism is violence. Um, black background, white letters, huge. And I'm like, can we have those every couple miles when we're driving so we can remember that this is what um, BIPOC and other marginalized communities, LGBTQ, deal with all the time. And um, I'm gonna read from my notes now. How might someone's race, ability, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, and religious slash spiritual affiliations impact their experience with trauma and help seeking. The impact of trauma may be experienced in the moment and over collective moments as traumatic and as part of the generational family story, which makes it as an, a historical trauma as well. When working with community, with BIPOC communities, we are going to be faced with multi-generational trauma. We need to be sensitive to the way in which people move through the world. Really, really important. I read this um, meme that said, if we have, if we're moving through the world with historical generational trauma, we also must remember we also have our ancestors, power, resiliency, bravery, love, passion for life, etc. And I'm, you know, that's my take on it. It didn't say all that, but um, we have all those things, the beauty, all of it. But when we're down, when we're not at 100%, when we're not feeling whole, it sure doesn't feel that way. It sure doesn't feel that way. And through the pandemic, I can share, um, I really got knocked down with many, many family deaths. On top of that, we're in a, we're in a pandemic. I'm not able to go to their funeral services. I'm not able to hold my loved ones. The isolation and it, there's just so many layers. There's so many layers and, um, but the tenacity and the perseverance and the love and the truth of being a human being that carries us through these things, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, you know, I was down for like two years over what had happened, down and trying and doing the best I could, but I was only functioning at a percentage of myself. And um, I really didn't completely realize it till all of a sudden I was at 100% again. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is, I'm even stronger and better than what I was in April of 2019 because I, I was allowed and I gave myself the space to deal with what I was dealing with. My employer allowed me to do that. I allowed myself to do that. You know, if all I could do was be in a fetal position, 
then that's what I was going to do. Just lay down because the body is doing so much. We think we're doing nothing, but within our systems and our human body, we're doing so many things. Just be. Michelle, do you have anything to add to this one? Thanks again for sharing um, about your experiences, Patricia. This, I think that the ways in which we have to think about our work continues to evolve over time because now we're doing it in the context of this pandemic and communities that are marginalized um, that uh, are, are harder hit by the pandemic as well as everything else, right? Um, I think a lot about, this week I think a lot about um, what's happening in Texas and what's happening in Florida, that there are these laws being um, passed or, or uh, pushed through um, to just continue to other and oppress LGBTQ communities. And as a member of that community, it feels really, uh, it feels just a lot closer than when I see when I see other laws passed that I know are not right, that they're not, they're not about my community, they're not about me, you know, that that hits different. Uh, it's all traumatizing, but it's closer, right? And, and I think on top of that about um, those teens right now that are trans right now, those kids that are trans right now, and how they're feeling about themselves when this is what's all over the news, when this is what's being talked about, you know, um, that they're growing up in a time when people are, you know, just really, you know, debating about whether or not they're whole people um, and the impacts of that. Um, that creates that historical oppression that stays with us forever. And then if we're assaulted on top of that, it feeds into the way we think about we can trust or not trust systems. I don't know. It seems like CPS kind of hates it in Texas, you know, thinks that me being trans is about child abuse. So why would I reach out for help? Right? Like the, it validates these, it. Mm -hmm. Right. So these all come together in our heads, right? The police are putting immigrant communities, babies in at the borders in cages, right? So what about that is going to make immigrant communities want to seek help or trust, right? Everything that we're doing externally in the social and political context are showing communities whether or not uh, they're worthy, right? So we have a worthiness and a shame issue that happens when we experience trauma, when we experience a sexual assault, and then we have the shame or blame that's happening in the context in which we live that really compounds that. Let's yes. Look at what's said here by Cass. Oh, go ahead, Patricia, and then I'll read that. I just wanted to share. There are ways in our everyday lives that we can help people who feel and are treated as invisible or disposable, as visible and worthy. And that is the reason we add pronouns to our, um, our name if we're comfortable doing so because there are non-binary, there are, there are so many of us, you know, and who we are and how we present in this world as our 100% selves. And we wanna honor that. And so this is a way of doing that. Of course, if someone's not comfortable doing it, they shouldn't. But if you are comfortable, why not? That is solidarity. Yeah. And then Cass says here, it's so important to recognize the impact of our identities on how we experience trauma and how we get or don't get help. So often the oppression is so much more vivid or prevalent because it's right in front of us. Remembering our ancestors are loving us, supporting us, giving us, giving to us is so important. Let us remind one another often with gentle strength. Thank you, Cass. The end. <laughs> That's the mic drop right there. Thank you, Cass. Uh, kind of the last piece I'll talk about in addition to um, historical trauma and then trauma and oppression and epigenetic trauma. So again, going back to the actual biological functions within our body, um, there 
was uh, at a, a hypothesis that individuals' experiences might alter the cells and behavior of their children and grandchildren. And this has become wi widely accepted based on this 2013 study that it's carried through at least two generations. We see that in the historical um, trauma uh, with the third and fourth generations of Japanese Americans uh, who come from um, families that were incarcerated in internment camps in the US, uh, but those were behavioral kind of um, studies. These are actual genetic studies in, that they did with mice. And parent mice were subjected to an electrical shock with, that came with a, a particular scent. And after enough exposure, the shock uh, is removed, but the mice continue to react to the scent as if they're being shocked. So they've learned this behavior. Their offspring who had never been shocked react to the scent in the same way as well as their offspring's offspring. They react to the scent as if they're being shocked, having never been shocked. It's incredibly interesting. And it really shows us, um, they also did some epigenetic trauma studies that are still kind of ongoing with, um, with humans, with um, Holocaust survivors and the generations um, after, uh, that came after those who survived the Holocaust. Um, so all of these things are great tools for us to have when we're working with survivors. It helps us understand the context in which a lot of people are living, the realities of what our brains and bodies are doing in the face of so much trauma, that all of this stuff are not, or all of these things are not things that we have to memorize, um, but, Sometimes it's like, you know, when you're working with somebody and you're like, I'm not quite sure what it is that they need, that talking about all of these things can be a useful way to begin a conversation. And to again, do like my colleague Britt said and said, you know, I remember something about epigenetic trauma and that might be really interesting for you based on all the things that you're talking to me about. Let's look it up. Let's read about that together. You know, um, I have a handout on this I'd like to give you to kind of think about. Um, and some people are here. Some people are really here uh, in their brains. As I was talking about um, the male survivor that I worked with who was dissociating and he kept driving different places. Um, I referred him to um, a therapist that was um, specializing in uh, child sexual abuse uh, because that was his experience. And um, he came back to see me later on and he was like, I didn't like her. And I was like, oh, okay, tell me about that. And he was like, I don't know, like I went and she had the sand tray out and she wanted me to draw on the sand. And I was just like, not into that. So I'm just not gonna go back. And I was like, well, okay, did you tell her you didn't like that? And he was like, no. And this is what I mean, Gracia, about what you're talking about as talkers. People don't know what they're supposed to do with therapy. This is your time and to give feedback and to participate in it and to collaborate. It's just not something that we're used to when we've just grown up with not a lot of choices, right? So I said, okay, well, um, you don't wanna go back, that's fine. But if I can suggest, maybe if you tell her that that didn't work for you. And so he's like, okay, I'll do that. Cause I'm like, at the very least, even if you don't like her, you're still, you're practicing your choice muscles and saying, this doesn't work for me, you know, instead of just not going. And he was like, okay, I'll do that. So he went back and he said, I'm not into this like drawing in the sand thing. And she said, okay, uh, what are you, you know, into, into working with? And what she ended up doing was drawing a picture of the brain and talking about what his brain was doing uh, in these different ways uh, uh, when he was a child, right? How his brain was developing, what parts of the brain do what, and being able to kind of open up this conversation where later on, months later, he was like, okay, I'll draw on the sand tray or whatever you want me to do, right? But you have to start in different ways. Some people don't want to jump in with science talk. And for some people, that's a super 
um, easy and accessible way for them to jump into talking about brain science because emotions are not where their comfort level is. And for others, talking about emotions is the better way to start because science is not something that they're interested in learning about, right? So we're just having all of these different tools so that we can say, okay, hey, here's a helpful thing. What about this? No, I'm not into that. Okay, great. What about this other thing, right? Because sometimes just talking about rape culture can be so validating for survivors, right? Uh, instead of neurobiology of trauma. And for others, it's, you know, it's the other way around. So we just have all of this information that we can pull from to say, okay, let's try this, right? So Gracie, I hope that is also helpful in kind of thinking about your, your non-talkative folks. Um, it's really like, what's going to work for you? And here's how therapy is. And, you know, here's how to talk to me about what I'm doing uh, if it's not working for you, right? Because sometimes you have to just practice that. That's a big part of those, the choice, the building the choice muscles um, and, and asserting ourselves. And, and that's all part of healing, even if it's just about talking to me about that. Um, it helps to build those muscles to be able to talk to somebody else that might be harming you or, or oppressing you or, you know, different things like finding your voice. And then just at the end here, um, I want to offer this quote as well from Helen Keller that says, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. Finding ways of positive reframe. Um, finding ways, uh, when I was doing legal advocacy, um, I had these just quotes like this, and black on white, just all around my desk, it's just these like printouts of these, these quotes, because I needed these constant reminders that everything doesn't, wasn't just the suffering, right? It's a little bit like the half, the glass half full, half empty thing, right? How are we doing positive reframes so that we can move through this. It's like Cass said, right? It's like our ancestors are, are loving us, supporting us, um, even though we're seeing all this other stuff that's hurting us in front of our face, right? How are we finding the balance between connecting with reality and also understanding that there is, you know, that we're also seeing the resilience and anything that we can do to integrate that into our work to be able to participate in that resilience one of your clients is graduating from high school and they invite you, go. Be part of that resilience piece. Help to celebrate those accomplishments. Don't just be there for the, the hard stuff. Help to celebrate the, the good stuff. And then when you hear things, like if you tell a survivor about tonic immobility and they say, oh my God, that made me feel so much better, pull that in and give that to yourself, right? That's something that you, that you helped with. We have to have compassion satisfaction to combat compassion fatigue. Don't minimize those accomplishments. Those are huge. And I love what Esther wrote in the chat. We are the carriers of hope for victims. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. So throughout this, Patrice and I are both going to share these, just these different things, these different ways of like helping us kind of keep going, right? Our connection to our why, right? Patrice's um, little grandbaby, Joaquin, right? Is that Joaquin? Yeah, yeah. Great, great, great grandson, Joaquin. Great grandson. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then, you know, just some of these touchstones of these, these quotes, these reminders, um, uh, I always like to also thinking about, think about seeds being planted, right? That they grow in the dark first. And so you don't see the flower, you don't see the tree when you plant it, if you've moved on, right? And so we're planting seeds with survivors. Um, and so I like to help to, that also helps me to kind of keep going to move through because compassion satisfaction. Is and we're gaining new quotes from the mic drop phrases and yeah. Our sentiments, your thoughts that you put in chat. Thank you so much. Exactly. It is well, very, very rewarding work. Yeah. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. As you can tell I'm doing so much of the talking today um, because I just I really am 
these are all just things that have really helped me in my work with survivors and as, as in my work as a survivor myself, like all of these things have been really useful for me and I hope that you can um, use them yourselves um, and that they're helpful for you as well. So that's what we have for you today. We of course welcome any questions and if there aren't any questions, um, you know, we can still stick around and chat at the end. Um, that's why we always give us a cushion up to 1230 so that we have enough time to have a conversation with folks. You're very welcome, Jazz. Definitely more interesting than talking about ethics. <laughs> See you next time, Daria. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Esther. Mm -hmm. And it's not monotone, <laughs> Michelle. Thank you. And you can use the word folks as many times as you want. It's just, I don't use it. I know, it just works so well for me. Yeah, of course. It's you. You know, if it's you, it's, yeah. And it's so many people I've noticed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're, thank you, Carly. If you're ready to leave, you know, I hope you will still take the last half hour um, to do something relaxing, um, to, to take a break from work, um, to go outside and get some fresh air if it's not totally freezing. It's pretty cold here, but the sun is out. I've been standing in the warm, the sun window, you know, because it's a little too cold to go out between things so it's nice warmed up it's warmed up in Tacoma to 40 degrees balmy <laughs> you oh Nancy's asking if we have a training for the public or maybe you know the resource um yeah we have a uh, we have a number of um of trainings uh, within our e-learning course and some recorded webinars that are open to the public. Um, I think most of our webinars that we put on are open to the public as well. Um, but our audience generally is advocate, so it's uh, the framing isn't as um, useful because we talk about working with survivors instead of something for survivors. But yeah, we've got we've got some different stuff. Our people have left, so we're going to say, have a great weekend. Thank you, Thank you. Lori and Thank Cheryl. You have a great weekend. You guys are the best. See ya. Take care. Oh, did I stop the recording?